So at this point, we will start the public session. Would a member of the Board of Selectmen please read the call? Get it? There will be a public hearing conducted by the Granby Board of Selectmen on January 7, 2019 at 7.05 p.m. in the Granby Town Hall Meeting Room, 15 North Granby Road, to hear and consider the following item. Proposal to use the F.M. Kearns Primary School located at 5 Canton Road as a community center for Granby and surrounding towns. <coughs> at the hearing, interested persons may appear and written communications will be received. Copies of the proposal are on file and available in the Community Development Office. Information is also available on the town website. John D. Ward, town manager. Thank you, sir. <coughs> at this point, I'll turn it over to the town manager for remarks first. Thank you, Mr. Finley. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight's public hearing is primarily for to give an opportunity for everyone to hear about this proposal and then to ask any questions they may have on it. Uh, the timeline that I anticipate us following is, is, is as follows. On the regular board agenda is a request or a suggestion for the creation of a limited advisory committee. In addition, a request for authorization to sign a non-binding letter of intent. Those don't have to be acted on tonight, but the selectmen do have that option. If the committee is created, I would ask that they meet briefly and report back to the Board of Selectmen on or about March 15th. Uh, if things are still moving forward, at that point, the Community Development Director, Abigail Kenyon, will present the request to planning and zoning for what's called an 824 referral. Um, I would also suggest that the board ask for the input from the development committee. Uh, again, assuming everything is proceeding at that point, administration, along with the town attorney, would speak with the committee and come up with an, a draft license, rather, lease. That lease would be brought back to the Board of Selectmen for their ultimate consideration. That's the process I see, assuming this goes forward. Now I just want to segue and give you a little bit of information on current school itself. As far as the proposal, I'm going to defer to the current steering committee to address that, uh, which they are prepared to do so. The current school was built in 1957, with the second building built in 1992. Additional classrooms were added in 2001. Uh, the building sits on approximately 8.2 acres um, of land. It is uh, encompassed by 21 acres, the majority of which are wetlands. The Board of Education decommissioned the school and closed in 2016, at which point it was turned over to possession and control by the town. There's approximately 12.8 acres of developable area remaining. The property is residential R30. Uh, if it is converted into housing lots, it's anticipated that approximately 11 single family lots could be developed. Um, I'd like to thank the Kern Study Committee for their fine work. And as many of you may know, the report, which is on the town website, basically made two recommendations for the property. That it be sold uh, for redevelopment either as is or to be demolished and then just have the lot sold. The alternative to either one of those was to retain it for town use. Uh, with concern noted about increase to town cost. The proposal that came um, to the town was not solicited. Uh, it's basically a hybrid of those options. It is where a not-for-profit group would operate it at no cost to the town to provide benefits to the community uh, as a community center with a component of adult daycare. Um, this can be looked at through many different factors, one being revenue, but primarily as an opportunity to fully utilize the town asset and to provide enhanced services to the town. 
Um, the town will not be subsidizing this endeavor, uh, and the town is not looking to step in and partner with Currents as far as the actual delivery of services. Should this proposal be deemed not meritorious for any reason, um, then we would look to a plan B of looking to put this out for an RFP or plan C of demolishing it and selling it for building lots. Um, and I'll speak to rewards the letter of intent more fully at the Board of Selectmen meeting, but I just want to note that's a non-binding document. Um, it does not transfer any rights or obligations even when executed. Um, and any transfer is contingent upon all necessary approval, not limited to planning and zoning and the Board of Selectmen. So having given you a little background on the property and on the process, I will turn to the current steering committee to present focusing in on what they anticipate as far as their programs and proposals are. Thank you. Thank you guys for being here tonight. Of course. Um, so first, our names. I'm Elliot Altamir. I live actually in East Granby on Route 20. I'm Jenny Bussey, and I live at 10 Farmview Lane here in Granby. Alicia Newton, 9 Stratton Road in Granby. Great. And I'll get the mouse. Yeah, go ahead. All right, uh, go ahead and All right, hi guys. When my family and I moved here a few winters ago from out of state, I knew that finding a supportive community was critical for the success of such a big move. I have been very intentional about connecting with like-minded people because without family or close friends or babysitters nearby, my husband Justin and I were at great risk for feeling very isolated. As the wife of a veteran and the mother to special needs children, I believe that isolation is both mentally and physically detrimental. Without the support of, of, of the community that we have built, built here, many of you who are part of that community, my mental and physical health would have suffered. What I have found here in Granby is an abundance of kind and generous people and more resources than I could have ever imagined. There are a lot of good people doing a lot of good work here. A few months ago, I learned, like many of you through the grapevine, about Kern's Community Center proposal. Uh, it made sense to me right away and seemed like a perfect solution to bring those awesome resources together to enhance them and provide an opportunity for much needed collaboration. I asked how I could help, and since then, I have been working with the steering committee. I am so impressed by the amount of time and energy and talent that has already gone into this project thus far. Over the last year, yes, a full year already, so many people have been involved in this project. I am especially grateful for the work that Elliot and Alicia have done to bring this project to this point. They have been fiscally responsible, inclusive, and completely servant-hearted, keeping their focus on our mission statement. I believe that community is the cure for the disease that we call isolation. And I cannot think of a better solution to this epidemic than Kern's Community Center. Um, so we talk about isolation a lot in the work around this project. And it can feel strange to talk about isolation when we can make and sustain so many online connections. Right now, so many of us are connected via Facebook, Instagram, and email with 20 to 50 people every day. And yet, when Americans are asked how many close friends they have, the most common answer is zero. In the 1980s, the most common answer was four. We've gained fast, easy online communication, but many of us have lost the in-person grounding relationships that used to sustain our communities. As a nation, we've traded floor space for friends, we've traded stuff for connections, and the result is we are one of the loneliest societies that has ever been. There's been a surge of research over the past decade around isolation, and the research is showing that isolation is our greatest health crisis, having a greater impact on our health than what we've associated with obesity. Social isolation impairs immune function and increases the body's inflammation. People who identify as lonely have the same level of stress hormones flowing around their system as you or I would if a stranger walked up and punched us in the face on the street. 
Um, except for lonely people, it's a constant everyday experience. And we normalize it, and it becomes expected, and that's an unbearable reality. Addiction becomes a way to escape that pain that otherwise feels inevitable. People who feel lonely and isolated are three times more likely to die in any given year and three times more likely to get a cold or a flu. At a time when we are more and more virtually connected, we're finally beginning to name that we are, in fact, lonely and that our loneliness is killing us. So we've had a lot of conversations um, in the community about who is feeling isolated. So we've talked to veterans. Veterans are claiming that they feel isolated. Senior citizens, teens and middle schoolers, military families, middle-aged men, stay-at-home moms, even the 20-somethings, parents of kids with special needs, caregivers for family members with dementia, all of these have reported feeling isolation. And when it comes to addressing isolation and the depression and anxiety and addiction that can often stem from it, um, we require two separate things. One is we require other people, and here it's not the number of connections we have because we have so many online, um, it's the quality. We need to be able to build lasting, meaningful relationships with the people around us. And then with them, we need to share a sense of meaning with them. We need some work that matters to all of us that we share in that together. Jobs used to do this a lot more than they do now. Churches still do this for some and used to do this for a lot more. Um, for most Americans, there aren't places where they can access both of these things together. And that's our vision for the Kearns Community Center, an intergenerational community that fosters healthy relationships while engaging us together in the work of caring for our shared community. So this is a central place for lots of activities to be happening in one place where community can come together around, uh, around those activities. Uh, imagine you drop your teenager off at the teen center and you take an art class with your younger child while you wait. Or you pick up a wheelchair, a wheelchair at the durable medical equipment closet before taking your elderly parent to the cafe for dinner of soup and fresh bread. Or you come to the community supper and then you visit at the putting green with some friends afterwards. Maybe you've taken a nature walk while your wife teaches a birdhouse building to the middle school wood class, or you bring your dad to the adult daycare program and take advantage of the caregiver support group that meets right next door. So many services are already existing in this community in silos. Services with incredible groups of people committed to providing the services and connecting the people with our community. All of these services and ex both existing and the ones yet to come will benefit from a shared location. So our mission statement, which we referenced earlier, with, um, right now is Kearns Community Center empowers people to build lasting relationships, strengthen their communities, and share their gifts. Um, so We've had a bunch of conversations since the start of this project with as many different groups as we could reach. Um, since the beginning, those groups have especially included everyone that could feel we were duplicating what they were already doing and what they were already doing well. Um, we've talked to groups that offer arts programming, um, groups that other, offer other workshops, libraries, the YMCA, churches, faith leaders, the senior centers of Granby and East Granby, youth directors, and more. And that's because the success of the community center can't come at the expense of any existing institutions or services in town. And we know that, and that's been a foundational premise from the start. Every conversation we've had with existing groups, businesses, and agencies has been about what we should be wary of doing that would hurt their mission and how we can support one another. As something new, we get the opportunity to be creative about how we build together. So we'll focus on the things that only we could provide. There's not another teaching kitchen in this region, or a social model of adult daycare, or an indoor park, or a big youth space that's only for teens. As we move forward, we get to collaborate with other agencies who run art programming in the area so that we don't duplicate services. We get to invite local instructors to use our space to run events. We get to collaborate with social services to find out how we can help meet unmet needs. Um, and work collaboratively with everyone to strengthen our local economy and our local community. 
And we get to keep having these conversations. The conversations we've had already are not the end of the, of the picture. Um, every quarter we get to check in with all of the groups that we're working in conjunction with or who are also aimed at strengthening our local community. We get to check in to find out what's working. We get to find out what's not working. How do we adapt and change as we go so that we can benefit all of us while still providing the services that we need and not duplicating the existing efforts? That that work is constant. That check-in and that communication is constant. Um, these conversations will never be over. The community center would constantly be in a process of assessing its impact, making changes to better support the community, and building relationships with the other people and the institutions that are already at play and already meeting so many important needs. Um, so we want to do a walkthrough with you of the building. Um, and I recognize that only half of you will actually get to see it, maybe, because the building's going to be up there. Um, we'll, we'll do this quickly. Um, there's also a link on the back of the handout. There's a link. There's like the two-dimensional map. Um, and there's a link on the front to the bigger two-dimensional map so that you can at any time go and look at it. Um, this 3D walkthrough is only available here for right now, at least. Um, so zoom out a little bit, great. Um, so we'll start here, we're just gonna talk through the different spaces so that you can see um, what we've been seeing in our heads and on sheets of paper for the past year. Oh, I'm in the way. <laughs> no. um, so down here's the gymnasium. So this is where 10 and 202 are, right? So 10 and 202 are down on this walkway. Um, here's the gymnasium. Um, we'll get to convert the gymnasium into an indoor multi-purpose space. We're essentially gonna ungym it Parks and Rec and the YMCA already meet recreation needs. We get to have a big event space. We get to have a community stage. We get to turn it into all kinds of different things at different times. Uh, there's the entrance where people, the administration used to have offices. We'll have the welcome area. Um, and then the next couple rooms over in this building are, um, we have three rooms dedicated to adult daycare. So right now the adult daycare program that we have mocked up um, allows for 25 participants at any one time. Um, we'll staff it so that we only staff what we need. So if we don't fill 25 spots, we then of course don't pay for staff for 25 people. So we adjust the program to meet the demand. It'll be a social model of adult daycare. Connecticut runs two different models and we'll get licensed through the Connecticut Association of Adult Daycare Programs. Um, the social model is for people who don't perhaps need locked wards or advanced medical care, but do need a safe place, they need enrichment, they need other social connections. Um, and of course their caregivers need a place where um, the, they can also be taken care of, right? The caregivers are experiencing an obscene amount of stress that's exhausting. And so that we also get to have next door to that and in other places, caregiver support groups or groups that are for people living with dementia and the people who care for them at the same time. So around the adult daycare center gets to be a lot of other programming integrated into the rest of the community. The adult daycare center is three rooms. It's got a like seating area and hangout area, couches. It's got a room for like workshops or tables. And then it's got a rest area as well so that when people are tired, they can uh, you know, go retire and rest. Um, the name we have for, adult, for the adult daycare program right now is Greatest Generation Recreation. Um, and we're excited for that. Uh, so moving down the hall, um, uh, we have a quiet room so that at any point there's a place um, if you bring your kids to an event and they get overstimulated or you get overstimulated, there's a place to go um, to, to sit quietly so that you don't have to leave when you or someone um, get overwhelmed by everything that's going on, right? So how do we make this space accessible to everyone? How do we make this space accessible to people with special needs or parents with special needs children? Part of that is that we make sure there's spaces to meet those needs, and we're planning that from the beginning. Um, we've got a room for the robotics programs. Um, we can keep going over. OK, sorry. Uh, we've got a gentle movement room, so whether that's people who want to come in that already offer yoga workshops or qigong or tai chi um, meditation workshops, we've got a space for that. Um, one general workshop space that we can run, you know, have people come in and run financial advising workshops or, um, you know, intro to uh, natural plants gardening to attract good biodiversity to your yard, like a general, how do you want to run a workshop? We have a space we can make it happen. 
Uh, we have a veteran space, a space that'll just be for veterans. Um, we're not planning to like coordinate any programming in that space. We are planning to make that a space that um, the veteran community gets to take leadership over. What do they want in it? What do they want to do in it? Um, we're providing that space in this plan. We're not trying to coordinate programming within that space. Um, and then if you pull out a little bit, the big extension to the building closest to 10 and 202 that went in, I don't know how long ago, um, we're, we're turning into a team space. And so knocking a bunch of the walls down to provide one large open area with couches, foosball, tables, arts and crafts stations. Um, retaining one classroom to serve as a media room so that they can play Smash Brothers or whatnot, and another classroom to keep as like a quieter study space. And so that's a teen center. Um, we'll get to run programming in there, and also we'll get to have a space for teens. And it's regional, so it's teens from Granby and East Granby and Heartland and the you know parts of Simsbury that want to come out and visit. Um, on the bottom, we've got a space. We've got. Um, two rooms with a dividing wall in between them. We've got a recording studio for GCTV to use, as well as other people interested in using recording studio and booth. Um, and then we've got a music classroom next to it. And the wall can be removed so that if we're trying to record a 10-piece band or some larger ensemble, that we actually have a space to do that. Um, we've got a durable medical equipment closet uh, planned. Right now, the durable medical equipment closet is based out of Holcomb Farm. Um, we're excited about the potential to put that in a more central location so that people who are coming in to get a wheelchair um, or a walker or an assisted toilet seat, all of the different necessities for how people can live in their homes, um, are also then connected to the larger community um, just by going to the center. But that's a, seniors are a particularly vulnerable population, especially when it comes to isolation. So to put that service in this community center feels like a very strong match for our mission statement. I think that's the bottom of the building, or the building closest to 10 and 202, so I'll pass it over to Alicia to talk about the kitchens. Okay, so anyone who knows me knows that this is the part that I get really excited about because I think food is central to everything. Um, so <laughs> we have in this area um, a community cafe, which is going to be modeled after a company that does them all over the country. It's One World Everybody Eats. Um, our high school students actually are going there to learn from them and to also share what they've been doing. Um, and it's a model of pay what you can. So our teens are already rescuing food from food waste and turning that into free meals anyway. So we're going to put that on a larger scale and put that in here. Um, we have teaching kitchens in the back corner. <clears throat> so um, that can be used. I run classes, but this can really be used by anybody that has maybe you um, enjoy canning and you want to share that specialty with somebody else, with a group of people. So we can have that workshop going on in these teaching kitchens. They'll be set up with stations to accommodate an entire classroom of children if we have classrooms come out. Um, but it can be you know, classes as small as four people all the way up to 24. We'll also have capabilities put in there so that we can live stream it either throughout the building or in people's homes so that that can be accessible to people. And then on the other side of that wall is um, our incubator commercial kitchens. So let's say you want to start a catering business, right? And you need a commercial kitchen space. <coughs> you can rent out space here and start up your business and also get business coaching um, through the center and get your business started up. And maybe even put on some dinners at the community center to trial that business. Um, <coughs> I'm really excited about this because I really do, like I said before, I think food is central to everything. People think about how you sit down to a meal with others and what that does to build community. We've been trialing community dinners um, in East Granby. I know Granby has Wednesday night dinners. And it's a wonderful sense of community when you're sharing a meal with others. And um, we also envision, you know, we have our adult daycare program. They can come and share meals. You know, you have your teens coming, so it's going to be intergenerational as well. <coughs> and Jenny's going to hit up the rest. Okay. <laughs> yeah. She'll move down to the, anybody want to guess what that great big green space is? <laughs> That's our indoor park. 
Um, I'm really excited about this because I moved here from Texas and I had never heard of something called seasonal affective disorder. That doesn't happen in, te in Texas. We have plenty of sunshine there. But here, much like the bears, I've noticed you guys ha hibernate in the winter, which is a real problem for your mental health and for your just your physical health. Um, in fact, my friend Amanda Lukenbill told me after the first winter I was here, she had purchased a tower garden and it has lights on it and she was growing food indoors and after that first winter that she had her tower garden, she said, this is the first time in my life that I can remember not struggling with seasonal affective disorder. And I thought, whoa, this is, this is big. This is bigger than I realized. This is a serious problem that can easily be remedied. So I envision in this area, um, those four columns are, have to be stayed there for stabilization. And so we're gonna decorate those like trees because kids need to learn, know how to climb trees. They'll be um, the putting green and there'll be tons of space. We're going to do some indoor growing in there to provide that light um, and just the feeling of being outside in the winter. Um, I envision, and this is just to kind of show you scale our little guy there. So it's a big, it's a big space. It's actually four classrooms that we've opened up. So, okay, move down to the next. Let's see. Um, that's an art classroom. And that one is a co-working space in the in the back. So, um, if you have a home-based business, or if you maybe you live in Glastonbury, but you have clients and you do some work here in Granby, and you need a, a space to work, um, you can use our co-working space. If you need a conference room, we also have a conference room space that can be rented or used for whatever meetings. Um, this. And an accordion wall, so that space can get opened up into a much larger conference space. If necessary, to yeah, hold up to, I don't know, probably. It's so hard to know. Yeah, yeah. 40 people, let's say. Um, this colorful space here is for children with young families. So um, again, that's a place where moms can come, dads can come, grandparents can come and connect while kids have a safe place to play. Um, and this space at the very end of the building is our wood shop and machine shop and maker's space. Um, so the way I envision that, my dad was a woodworker and I know how to use a lot of tools. And it makes me really sad to know that there's so many kids who don't even know how to turn a screwdriver. So I would love to see intergenerational um, activities happening here. I would love to see people teaching younger generations how to use tools, how to make their own things. We had a great suggestion recently that can you envision like a kid is able to make something really cool and then sell it in our in our cafe or in a shop. I mean, how fun would that be for them? Anyway, so that is our um, that is our that's a really large space as well with the wood shop and machine shop. Yeah. Yeah. What else? I think that's the end of the building. Yeah. Okay. Um, Oh, magic, how are you doing? <laughs> Take your gun All right, so what's happened already? Um, we've had conversations with Senator Whitcos, and we've talked about developing a proposal for state bonding in which government, Governor Lamont will vote on in June. <coughs> so that is kind of the basis for a lot of our timeline. Um, with the state needing to address the deficit, regionalization projects are highly desirable. So he's pretty confident that this is something that will get moved forward. With 169 towns in our state, many of them are closing schools due to low enrollments. Kearns Community Center could become a model for the state, which is really exciting to think about. You know, Granby will be put on the map for this. And there are so many people that are already really deeply invested in this project. We have construction engineers, architectural engineers, designers, a really strong core team of volunteers, website designers and construction, financial advisors, legal advice, construction and roofing contractors, and so many more that are just waiting for the right time to lend their expertise. Most everyone we've talked to have been really excited and ready to become involved and be a part of something that they can envision improving their lives and the community that we all call home. Oh, and I, sorry, it wasn't in the notes, but the Hartford Foundation, we've already met with in person at their offices, and they've expressed a lot of interest in this, um, in this project. Um, they're looking for ways to continue to support the towns within Hartford County that they haven't done a lot of support with yet. 
um, this is really exciting to them. They came out and did a listening session maybe in March or something of 2018, and they were stunned by the um, commitment to community that they heard and the number of people who got up and spoke about the desire for a community center. Yes. And so they've been following this project and talking with us since then. If you guys go on their website, you'll see Granby represented quite a bit. Um, they made a video. Um, Mr. Conley's in it. <laughs> and it's still a good video. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so our next steps. Um, and this is what we've mapped out for our next steps. We hope that we will gain the Board of Selectmen approval and a letter of intent so that we can begin our official fundraising. That's kind of been a barrier for us to begin fundraising. Many individuals and organizations have expressed a desire to donate, <coughs> such as the Harper Foundation. Um, Senator Whitcoast is also waiting for the letter of intent to move the bond legislation forward. And we will not begin construction until we have a minimum of 1.5 million so that we don't begin a project that we can't finish. That's really important to us. We can do most of what we want with that amount. However, the indoor park and the teen space would be multiple smaller areas. We wouldn't be able to take down those walls. Um, so we wouldn't have that large open space that we showed you. We also wouldn't have air conditioning in all of the areas. Um, we would use secondhand furniture instead of having new furniture. And we wouldn't be able to make the center into an emergency shelter like we hope. If we were to be able to raise the full 2.75 million, like we've put in our proposal, then we can do everything that we've shown you tonight. Um, so a little about our staffing structure. Um, so we'll have an executive director that reports to the board of directors. Um, that'll be me. Uh, I, like all executive directors, serve at the request of the board. And so the board of directors is always in place to make sure that whoever is serving as the executive <coughs> director has the skills, the capacity, the time, the temperament, all of the things required to successfully run a nonprofit. Um, we'll have a director of community engagement. That person's uh, in charge of making sure that everyone who walks through the door is plugged into the community, the community that extends far beyond the walls of the community center. Um, and also, this person will help oversee the volunteers. We'll have a director of facilities that's charged with overseeing the physical building and maintenance. A director of operations oversees business growth, HR, finances, legal compliance, and insurance. And so we'll carry insurance for the activities that happen in the center and for the building itself. So that's part of our plan is to hold that insurance and to hold that financial risk. Um, we'll have an adult daycare administrator who takes point over seeing the adult daycare itself. Um, they'll also oversee the other staff, so an activity coordinator, direct care providers, and a driver. Um, our budget includes a van, maintenance for the van, and a full-time driver to help get people to and from the center. Um, if, the care, you know, if your caregiver is working, figuring out transportation can be really hard. Um, or if you have accessibility needs, the car that you drove for the first 40 years doesn't work anymore. And so actually making sure that we have a van so that we can get people there and back. The teaching kitchens, the cafe, and the incubator kitchens will actually be overseen by Alicia Newton, who's the executive director of Nourish My Soul. Um, so within that teaching cafe, the cafe income will go to the community center. The programming income will go to Nourish My Soul. And so that's the setup that exists right now, is that Nourish My Soul runs programming and gets the programming income. The difference here is that there will be a cafe attached to it, and the cafe income gets to go to the community center. And Nourish My Soul is paying, would pay a monthly like, sub-lease for that area, just as if we rented it out to anyone else. Um, hand it over to our timeline. OK, so here's our timeline. Right now, we're working on town approval and 501c3 status. Um, initially, we planned on fiscal sponsorship, allowing another agency to carry the 501c3 status and oversee our operations. But when our budget crossed the $1 million threshold, we outgrew that opportunity, which actually is great because it allows us to keep that money here and work with local agencies in our community. We'll hire our own operations director, and we are already working with local financial and insurance agencies to keep our center safe and insured. Um, we're also working on finalizing our board of directors. Once those steps are done, we'll begin fundraising, and we hope to have a minimum of the $1.5 million that Alicia mentioned raised by July 2019 so that we can begin renovations. 
Again, renovations will not start until we have that amount in hand so that we know we can finish the project. Uh, we're looking at three to four months of construction and renovation time, um, and we're aiming to open the doors at the end of 2019. Yes, this is an aggressive timeline. I know that's what you're thinking. Um, but guys, we want to capture, it, we're, it's aggressive for two reasons. First of all, we want to capture the excitement generated over the last 12 months. And secondly, and most importantly, is to prevent the further deterioration of the physical building. Um, I've been in the building twice, and it was a few months apart, and it's dramatically um, deteriorating, as any building would that's left, you know, sitting, up, sitting out in the elements. Um, so as a Grand B taxpayer, I don't want to see an asset that valuable just go to waste sitting there. Oh, and finances. So there's a link. Um, there's a link on your one pager to the full budget. There's a couple of links on the one pager to a 2D version of the map to the full proposal and to the budget. The quick overview is that we're looking at an annual operating cost of about a million dollars. Um, the yearly increase in operating costs is less than the yearly increase in income, and so we'll start to make money. The third year is expected to be our break-even point, and you can see the details of that budget online. Most of our income will come from the cafe, will come from limited workshop income, um, running special events, and the adult daycare program. We've planned in this budget, we've made it as hard as possible for ourselves. Um, so we've planned for very limited fundraising income, but the center has incredibly strong fundraising potential. This type of addressing community isolation, of addressing community mental health, of integrating services, of doing something in a regionalization focus, this is um, you know, working with seniors and youth and veterans and special needs. All of this uh, makes us an incredibly powerful draw for fundraising. And that said, we've built ourselves the budget as hard as we could for ourselves to make sure that it can succeed. Um, and we've also included a small cushion for the first few years. We don't hit the break-even point until year three. And so our fundraising, whether it's the 1.5 or more than that, includes a cushion to get us to the break-even point without running out of money. And that's our presentation. So I'll pass it back to At, at this Scott. point, before I open it up um, to the board, uh, I do want to say that this was outstanding. Um, great presentation. Can we give them a round of applause? you but I'm very visual that was great to see the different rooms I mean you can see it on paper but it's that we was had a little cool. help. We had, yeah, that we was good. Good. <laughs> so much help. I'm easily amused that, that was pretty good um, but before I open it up I, what I'm excited about is you're removing should this go forward and there are some you know financial uh, issues here but should everything work the way it's planned to, it's going to remove an expense. Right now, we put 30 to 50 grand to try and maintain that building. It's upsetting, it's falling apart, but you know, obviously, more money needs to go toward it. Um, but more importantly, you're enhancing services for everybody. I know if, if I'm allowed, I'm going to be on that putting green. You should see me golf, it's not good. Hopefully that'll help, but you're enhancing services. It's important to me that you're not taking services from, you know, our senior center, from Holcomb Farm, from other community things. It looks like you've met with folks, you've looked into that, and, and you'll continue to communicate with them, which is important. And, you know, the, the third thing is a a town asset's going to get improved, um, and it seems like it's going to be used to the full extent of that any town asset could be used. That that's that's great. So um, it, it's exciting to see. And as as I've talked to you guys, I went to that thing in March. That's why it looks so pretty in the video. But uh, um, the only thing I had a question on. And because I don't know, what is that Smash game you're talking about? Should I know? <laughs> should I know what my kids I, are I playing? Don't know or? That. That's fine. It's not 
<laughs> okay, James, we'll talk later. Um, so that's that's good. So thank you very much for your presentation. So I'd like to get uh, the members of the board before we open it up to the general public. <coughs> Excuse me here. Any member? I'll start. Sure. So I was the uh, board of select liaison to the uh, <coughs> school study committee. And one of the exciting ideas that came out of that study committee was adult daycare. But we couldn't think of, sorry, the committee couldn't come up with any way to fill the entire building because you don't need an entire uh, 40,000 square feet to do just senior daycare. But this uh, community center captures that uh, senior daycare and then finds uses for the other spaces in the building. So I think it's uh, a great use of that building to uh, fill that need that was identified, but also uh, fill other needs to make the whole building useful. Thank you, Mark Vizzelli. I think that the concepts that we've heard about are really exciting. And, and again, the, the non-duplication of services, the addition of services that are, that are sorely needed, and the interdependency of kind of everything that's going to go on there. And um, I, I think going forward obviously there's a lot of detail work that has to be done and of course there's the money aspect of it and there's the the experience and the the, um, the governance of it but um, I think the concept of it is really exciting great thank you Ed? Uh, I think um, it's a great presentation and I think we've been privy to several presentations uh, by your group so it's helped us uh, keep abreast of what's going on you know I think the, the big aspect uh, obviously is the fundraising part of it and that's um, you know, that's, that's on to come and that's, you know, that's, that's the big process that's next in place. I, you know, I'm really curious to see what the, the public, and that's why we're here, to see what the public thinks and get your opinions and your views. Jim? Wow. Right? Well said, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I'll follow that up with something less insightful, but a tremendous amount of work done at a scale we haven't seen in this community. Um, really raising the bar in terms of public-private partnership in a way and, and um, transferring a burden from taxpayers to other uh, revenue sources, let's say. Um, I think it's tremendously exciting. I think it's been a, be a yeoman's effort you've done so far. It's only going to triple probably in work, to be frank on that. Um, you've got a very high bar, a high bar set here, um, I think. You know, we're looking at um, the potential to give you an opportunity to start that fundraising, which might be some of the proof. It is tremendous to see so many people here in support. Thank you, each and every one. I'm interested in hear your thoughts. I'd also like to include this, not to put you guys on the spot, but input from student liaisons. Yeah. Do you guys? Uh, it's pretty cool how, like, Sarah and I have both been uh, students of. Uh, Going to current, we, uh, you know, my second grade classrooms turned into a teen room that I can now go back to. It's pretty cool to see that. The furniture uh, will be bigger, so. <laughs> hand sanitizer a little higher. Yeah, he's not your typical cunnily. We're trying so. to get, we're trying to get Mrs. Camp to come. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So. Yeah, no, I know we talked about it last time we came. It's just really cool to see a space where we like grew up being turned into something that now everyone can use. So it's really nice. And that. Thank you guys for your input. Um, at this point, I'd like to ask members of the community to come up. Just you need to, for public record, come up to the mic, state your name and address. Uh, and if you could keep your comments to three minutes, just because we, you know, aren't used to all these people, so it'd be good if everyone gets an opportunity to speak. <coughs> Anybody want to be the first one? All right. And if you could raise your hand, too. There we go. My name's uh, Matt Tyo from Six Broken Arrow over the border in East Granby. Um, part of the reason why I'm excited about this and why I came is that it does kind of go beyond the borders. We're a lot of small towns, and it's kind of a shame that so many wonderful things kind of stop at the border for some reason, even though there's really no reason that it's a short drive, right? I'm right down the road. 
and the thought that this is a way to stitch the communities together and make us all stronger and kind of open new ways for us to work together that we haven't in the past is really exciting to me. Also, as the uh, father of young kids, the idea of being able to go to a children's playgroup where there are other things going on and I can interact with other adults uh, beyond <laughs> this children is a really fantastic idea that really resonated to me when I saw this proposal. So I wanted to come and lend my voice to say, I think this is really fantastic. Thank you. So when we take back the notch, that'll be some here happening. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, folks. I just, <laughs> you know there's a Facebook page about take back the notch? I thought that was funny. But anyway, anybody else, if you could raise your hand and come on up. Gentlemen in the back. And I apologize for not having enough seats. We never know who's going to show up. And this is where we publicize our meetings. So it has to be here unless we're privy in advance. So, yes, sir. Hi, I'm Del Shulkert, and I live at uh, Chatsworth Village. I just have a, a question. Uh, you had included in the proposal uh, parking, additional parking spaces. Where would that parking spaces go? Most of it will be reconfiguring the existing parking lot. So the existing parking lot was designed for buses to drive around. So we'll redo it. There's a small <coughs> additional amount that we might be able to take over, but it's not a big expansion into the rest of the grounds. All right. The other question I had is, has any study been done about whether there's asbestos in this building? Yes. Um, there is asbestos. 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 Yeah. Yeah. We. Uh, yeah. So we haven't had a study done, but um, we have had um, roofers and engineering engineers and roofers come into the building, and there are asbestos tiles there, which is one of the major concerns as a taxpayer. When I heard the other option is to tear the building down because asbestos abatement is very well, expensive. That's why, <laughs> that's why I raised the question. Yeah, we are taking that into consideration. It is a serious financial concern. So yeah, thank you. We also have a contingency in the budget. And we've, as we, well. and we've put in for, there's a, there's already like, you know, the mock up of what containing the asbestos tiles would cost is in the plan right now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Thank you for your question. Anyone else, sir? <coughs> <laughs> My name is William Scheel. I live in North Granby, Connecticut. And I want to say that this is really good. And my viewpoint is somewhat different. It's not financial. It is in the interest of what might I do for my community if I were to have this facility. So I'm a really messy artist. <laughs> and I enjoy my art. I like to teach my art. I've never found anybody from the age of one and a half all the way up to 90 who doesn't enjoy what I do. Now, this facility provides a unique opportunity. There's a wood shop. I'm a woodworker. There is a, a room where we can do really messy painting. And in my case, it will probably be between the two rooms because it's so messy I use an air compressor and splash paint all over the place. So I think that this is a unique opportunity for a person like me to engage with the community and engage a number of different types and ages and intergenerational kind of thing. I think it's a great idea. I fully support it. And I do hope that people understand that there are many people such as myself who find this an opportunity that really we would not have otherwise. There's very few places. I've done an art uh, fun day thing at Holcomb Farm. That's the only other facility in this entire area where we can accommodate my kind of mess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. If you could keep your seat clean, that, that would be <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, sir? Can I go first? Just say you go first. Sure. I'll go first. It's your call. <laughs> Try to be a joke. Nice. Thank you. Good job. So my name is Rita Wood. I've lived in town for 30 years, and um, I've seen this town change a lot over the years. I think this is great having the community center. My question is, would you charge rent if somebody wanted to use one of the areas? And um, that would have some revenue for you. And so I was just wondering if you would rent things out. And basically, I have an ulterior motive in that. <laughs> um, I square dance. Now, people don't laugh about that. 
but square dancing is one of the most intergenerational intergener activities. It is an activity that can go from 10 years old up until 90. And it's a great activity. It gets rid of that isolation. Um, it's a physical and mental activity. It really is, I mean, and I, my husband and I are presidents for all of New England right now. This is what we want to see in Granby. Um, and so, but I just was wondering if you would think about renting out space for people to, and that would give you some revenue as well if somebody wanted to use a, an area. And for with the square dancing, it would be on a weekly basis. So that's just no <laughs> other motive. But I just wanted to say that. So I think it's a great idea. Thank you. So now I know how to get more people to come yes. to coffee with Cumley, huh? <laughs> <laughs> square dancing. It'll be good. Square dancing is already one of the things we've considered for the big room. Um, so we've talked to people already about how to kind of acoustically deaden it so music works better in it. Um, the flooring. Um, and we have limited income from space rentals like into the project or into the budget. And that's based on whether it's like a community event that meets our mission statement, whether it's an outside group, whether they're a nonprofit or, so we have like tiered rental for the spaces that we think makes it accessible um, while also helping, you know, that when people come and enjoy it, they also, if they can, get to contribute to keeping the lights on. So yes, that's, we're so excited about Square Dancing. We will talk. Yeah. <laughs> one, of, one of the things I wanted to mention before we move on is we brought volunteer forms. If you're interested in volunteering, we would love your contact information so that we can plug you in and you can keep informed of what's going on. Awesome. <laughs> Sir. Because we want to do Square Dancing, but we don't know how to Square Dance. So <laughs> we need some help. Well, okay, I just thanks. Had something me and my wife have to be sweater. Presence is where I love it. Okay, make sure so you fill out our form. Like we've envisioned a club in this area, and we could probably bring very qualified followers and different people cool. into the area to do it. <laughs> so it would take us a while to make it a profitable thing. Yeah. <laughs> Sir. You love squares of dance, you know. <laughs> anyway, so my name is Vince Kikiti. I live on Acorn Drive. I've been a long time resident. I've been here since 81. And actually was involved in the initial refab of the oh, current cool. project, yeah. way back when. And there is asbestos in the house. So I'm, new, I'm, new to, I'm a newcomer to this whole project. But being in business, having worked on town projects, and being involved, I happen, to, I happen to look at, so what's the business plan for this? What's the ROI? Where do we get the revenue? What's the cost of staff? All of these kinds of questions I think we need to answer and understand. Uh, project looks like a great project. However, can we afford it and how will we support it? Uh, I don't have all the details, but I'd like to send somebody a letter or a note laying out all of my questions mm -hmm. and then be able to share that with the community. Because I think it's important for us to understand what this costs. It's also important if we have to go through the state for approvals, Having done that, it takes time. And nothing works rapidly with the state of Connecticut. So just understand those things. So I think you're aspirational in December of 2019. I think that would be wonderful if you could accomplish your project in that time frame. Just realize dealing with the state and the approvals and the rewrites and the redrafts takes time. So I'd like to understand more and I'd like the community to understand more about what's this really going to cost, what's the financials around this, and then what are the examples by which we have seen this work elsewhere? Where has it worked elsewhere? What do we figure we're going to have for, occup for occupation, occupancy in the building? You know, how many people are going to actually be there? It only helps isolation if people come. Yes. And what's going to be the motivation for them to get up off their duffs and come? So that's all I have. Thank and you. that's all part of the due diligence as well. So tonight would be, should a letter of intent move forward, then it would have to go through the entire process, uh, Board of Finance and, and other boards. So John. The uh, community center group has prepared a draft budget both for initial construction and operating. 
and they should be on the town website. <coughs> and I think they've been updated as of January 3rd. You've got hard copies out here? No, but the link is on the one pager that's handed okay. out. Um, and so please review it. And then Alicia, my emails are on the bottom. So yes, send us questions and we can publicize the answers. That would be great. If you could see a detailed project plan, mm -hmm. I can do this. Yeah. And if you could send us those questions to, to the town manager's office just to make sure you know, everything's included. And, I'm sorry. All seven pages. There you go. <laughs> uh, so the links on that paper, the handout, are also live links. So whenever we make updates, you're seeing what we're doing. Good. Great. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, hey, I, I'm, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry, she got her That's hand right. raised. Yeah. Sorry. My name is Debbie Realitz. I'm at 24 Silky Road. I'm a neighbor of Bill's and can speak to his messiness for his artwork. <laughs> but I play many roles um, in my life. One is uh, I'm president of the Granby Artists, so it's especially exciting that there is an art space um, in the community center that's being planned. Um, there are there have been spaces, but again, not necessarily one where a drop of paint here or there doesn't cause a crisis. So having a creative space that's okay for messes to be made in is really valuable. Um, and just to sh as a testament to their thoroughness um, in reaching out to different parts of the community, is I'm also a homeschool mom and also um, a gardener, and I've and a church member and so I've seen them reach out on all those different groups so I've run into them a lot on this <laughs> project <laughs> so it's been really um, impressive admirable how aggressively they've reached out to the community to find out what's going on and what is needed so um, from an artist's perspective it's been very exciting to see what's developing as well as a community member thank you thank you Thank you. Anyone else, please? Oh, I am sorry. And then you in the back. Great. Uh, thank you. My name is Ann Prokop. I live on uh, Cone Meadow Court in West Granby. Um, and so first I want to applaud the goals of the community center, incredibly laudable, their efforts, uh, incredible. Um, so my, I have slight hesitation to support, um, and I think it's just because I need a little bit more information. Um, I think the aspirational goal of raising that much um, fundraising within six months I, I just don't I'm not sure if that is terribly realistic and if that does not occur then what happens I feel like it's what we're doing here is, is just a paper solution because in six months I, I just would I find it very hard to believe that um, in an unestablished 501 3c could just stat could um, fundraise that significant amount of funds in such a short period of time. We're all drawing from the same same pool. Um, what would the impact be to the other, um, the main nonprofit here in Granby, the Y, which is one of the largest employers? They also rely on, um, I assume, some sort of, I don't know if they actually receive grants from the Hartford, but I just have a concern about that. Um, I'm not saying that there's not a need. I'm not sure if all of the needs have been fully identified and vetted. But I think um, a lot of the efforts and projects that they want to do are already um, being handled and um, uh, served by other churches, community centers, the rec center, all of that. So I feel like a lot of it is uh, du will duplicate those services. So I'm just not. I'm not ready to stand behind it 100%. I feel like we just need more information. Um, I'm new to the project as well, so um, I'm just wondering you know, what would happen in six months if that fundraising marker is not made, then, then what is the impact? Thank you. Do you guys want to answer this? Elliot, do you guys want to provide an answer? In terms no? of um, you know, the six months, I, I don't believe that it would be, a, you know, like a six months, you don't make it. If, if we're really far off from the mark, then I think that shows that maybe there is a lack of support for it. But if we're close, I think that's when we would come back and say, can we get an extension of time to raise that $1.5 million? Um, I don't think it's like a cutoff, like you either raise it and then it's done and dead. It's just we wouldn't start construction. So it would push the timeline. 
And that'll be, that's like all of those details are part of what, you know, we're not to the point of even talking with the town about yet. So that is a lot of like, there's a, it's part of the lot of work left to do is to work with the town in terms of what makes sense for the letter of intent for the initial agreement for the timeline. So thank you. We have some of those same questions. As far as the financial pools, that's a good concern. She, what she's talking about is, is fundraising from individuals or organization like a Lions Club or, you know, organizations in town. And that certainly is something that we've talked a lot about. The reason this project is not pulling primarily from those same financial pools is because of the grant opportunity, because of this project and its uniqueness opens us up to apply for so many different types of grants to meet the needs of those different groups, which is totally outside of what something like the Y does. I'm a member of the Y. I plan on continuing to be a member of the Y because they meet a totally different need. Um, they have a swimming pool that we use. My uh, son does adaptive gymnastics there. It's not something that the community center can provide for us. So I really don't see there a conflict. Again, we've been in communication with them and we're making, we're doing everything we can to be very intentional about not duplicating services. We, For example, we had a conversation with the rec center and they said, this and this are our major, major gener revenue generators. So on our proposal tonight, you saw nothing about those two things. <laughs> Because originally we kind of thought, hey, this might be something that we could do. And because that's a revenue, a major revenue source for them, we will not touch it. Good evening. My name is Rachel Banzer. I live on 197 Mountain Road in East Heartland. I just want to congratulate and say thank you for including a robotic space. I can let me tell you why. Why? So I'm the project group leader of the Grand 4-H Robotics Group. Two-year-old team, we've gone to the world championship twice. Yay, Grand we support you guys. But we struggle to find space to be able to have a uh, large enough space for a playing field. So that is a real struggle. That's a personal one, you know, team personal one. But on a bigger note, think of this. When you look at that robotics room and that community <coughs> center, we're exposing our kids to STEM careers. And if you look at 2005 to 2015, there was a 24% increase in STEM jobs. That's 5% higher than non-STEM jobs. And salary increases of 29%. So imagine with the robotics groups that are in there, being able to now bring it to even a larger pool, have more people join, be more exposure, having that maker space that we can work with others. You know, this is this is Granby, this is STEM, this is exciting. Thank you. Anyone else? Ma'am? In the purple. I think that's purple. Yeah. Hi, I'm June Ashworth. I've lived in Granby forever. <laughs> um, I have a couple specific questions. Um, number one, flexibility of space. Yeah. If you have your adult daycare center, mm -hmm. how big is that space? Like, what if you end up with an overflow yeah. of people? Do you have the ability? Oh, got it. So adult daycare um, will be, will work under the Connecticut Association of Adult Daycare Programs, like their guidelines. Mm -hmm. And so the space determines the staffing and also the participants. And so we can't overfill the adult daycare because it would take us out of code compliance and safety. So we wouldn't do that. So we So what's the number? I mean, 24. We've got 25, space for 25 participants at any one point. And then we fill that with a variety of people who sign up for like, 40 hours a week, or three mornings a week, or one afternoon, so it gets filled with a variety of different types of participants in terms of like hours per week that they mm -hmm. use the service. Well, I was thinking the same thing with the space for veterans. If, if right. I'm just looking to see if there is some flexibility. Yeah. The other thing, and I hate to say this, but in this day and age, is there any security? Oh, in terms of? Like who's coming in and out of the building? Yeah. Yep. Um, that we get to work with the same people the town hall and schools work with, right? right? We get to have a relationship with the police department. We get to make sure that we've got closed 
cameras, we get to make sure we have emergency procedures in place. Mm -hmm. All of that is part before we even open it. What are all of the different plans? Okay, that's my concern of just a random somebody entering the building without cause. Okay. Or, yeah, yeah, sure. Cause. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Anyone else, sir? Hi, my name is Nelson Tusi, and I live at uh, 279 Granville Drive. First of all, I'm disappointed that we couldn't all be in a place where we could see the presentation and sit down. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to think ahead. But sec so, first of all, my comment, I'm not here to talk about the project per se. Uh, I really don't know enough about it, but I, it's great to see so many people with a lot of enthusiasm. I would tell you, as somebody who's been around a long time, there's a long road from enthusiasm to cash in hand. So the work isn't even started yet of what it's going to take to get real money and not just a lot of uh, helpful support verbally. Anyway, what I came to talk about is to the selectmen. What I'd like to see you do, eventually, sometime at that <coughs> point, I assume that this goes to a town meeting where we talk about actually leasing, even if it's for zero dollars or selling some piece of property. But what I'd like to see as a taxpayer is what the opportunity cost is to me, the taxpayer. So if you think you want to lease this to them for a dollar or whatever it is at whatever point in time, I'd like to know that you've gone out and seen what the marketability of this property is, truthfully, not just some number out of the sky. Secondly, what is the marketability as a lease? And then if, if assuming there is one, present to these people what that would be and whether the taxpayers want to underwrite that or not should be up to them at some point in time. But that should be on the table so that we all know the facts. You know, it's great to, to have something like this. Probably half of the town, if not more, would take advantage of it. But it's also focused on the region. And I'm not sure that the Granby taxpayers should be paying the underwriting costs for this for the region. So we should talk about that before we move it forward. My second question is, because this is a public hearing, um, what is the purpose of having it as a public hearing as opposed to an informational meeting? It is an informational meeting. Okay, so but, th but this way it gives you an opportunity to ask questions and us to provide you or them to provide you with answers. Okay, okay, there's not a follow-on town meeting of any sort at this point. Not at this point. We're hoping to form a committee should the board decide for this to move forward. Right. So the committee will address some of those due diligence issues. Okay. Yeah, I, just so that you have it in writing, I've put together some of my thoughts. Great. So here, you can capture them later on. Thank you. Anyone else? Ma'am? My name is Laura Matheos. I live on Candlewood Lane in Granby. Um, to the gentleman's point of the follow-up question on opportunity costs, I would really also ask you sincerely to do an opportunity cost of not doing this. What are the opportunity costs of not providing a public good of this sort of nature? It's like saying, oh, well, an addiction program could cost all this money and we can't afford it as taxpayers. The amount of money that I'm going to save in my taxes of doing something else with this land, okay, a couple years might be nice. I got a kid going to college, that's nice. But what do you do if you don't do an addiction program? What are the costs of police, crime, blah, blah, you know, you know all right. the stories. So look at an opportunity cost for all the people who are saying, well, I'm a taxpayer and this doesn't make any sense in a dollar at least. What is the cost of not doing it? Mm -hmm. And if any opportunity cost sort of analysis is done, I really want to urge you to also include that silent public good aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. <coughs> My name is Emma Fetridge, and I'm a senior at GMHS. So I think this space would be very valuable to a lot of high schoolers as it would provide a space for us to work on projects after school or even just go and relax and have a space other than your home or school to decompress after a tough day at school. And also, um, 
I've known Alicia Newton for about six years and I work with her um, with Nourish My Soul and I help her teach cooking classes and I'm also a part of the group from the ground up. And I think that the teaching kitchens and the commercial kitchens would really benefit um, both of the programs that I help, that I'm a part of because for From the Ground Up, we've um, launched the community dinners in East Granby, and they've been extremely successful. We've had over 300 people at some of them, and we struggle sometimes to find places to actually cook the food or for other fundraiser events to cook food, so I think having these spaces available would be very helpful. Hi, my name is Eileen Swan. I live in North Granby at 22 Stonehead Way. I'm an attorney and an advocate. I also run a support group for <coughs> parents of special needs children here in Granby. And having spoken to many, many parents of children with special needs, I can tell you they are very isolated in this community. They feel very lonely. And when we first heard of this pitch and how it would work, I thought to myself, this is something that would really work for our families. It would bring the community together. A lot of people were asking the question about what is the cost to the town? And my question is, what is the cost to the town of not bringing this, of continuing the isolation, of developing more land for more families to come and not having services that could be useful for the youth in this town? We've had suicide youth. Um, youth commit suicide in this town. We've had uh, substance abuse problems in this town. We know that. And part of that is isolation. When you talk to some of the kids from the middle school, when they have half days, they want to go into town and hang out. So where are they going? They're going to some of the businesses and doing these things. I think this community center would be a perfect place for some of that stuff to happen. I think the cost to not having that, to bringing the community together, is really important. I think it's very ambitious in what they're doing. I've been the executive director of nonprofit organizations. I've been the deputy direct, executive director. So I know what it takes to get a 501 program going. I know what it takes to keep it going, to write the grants. It is very labor intensive. I know they've already done a lot of the groundwork. So I, I'm, I don't know if their timeline is going to be it, so, but nobody's business timeline ever runs that way. So I wouldn't even be in the least bit if they said they were two, three, four, six months off. It is what it is. That's what's going to happen. I think this would be an awesome investment for this community, and I think it would help our families uh, of special needs children come together in a space that people can feel very safe in. And I think that other members of the community would enjoy that space as well. There are some things, people talk about the why and stuff. The why is costly for some of these families. Not everybody is walking around with six-figure incomes in Granby, people. There are people who cannot afford the why. And the services that are provided at the community centers are not always meeting the needs of everybody. This program, this idea, will meet the needs of so many diverse communities that how could we not think about the wonderful cost to this community of bringing everybody together? Uh, and I just want to end my comment with a quote from Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Sir? My name is Eric Lukingbeal. I live on Day Street, and I've lived with my wife, Sally King, on Day Street since 1984. I'd like to follow up on the quote from Margaret Mead. It's a quote I agree with, but I'd like to share a, uh, an observation that occurred to me as I was listening to all these comments and all these questions. This is a quote from uh, a great American philosopher named Vince Lombardi. <laughs> Many of you have heard of Vince Lombardi. He was the coach of the Green Bay Packers. The Green Bay Packers won the first two Super Bowls. Yes, they did. <laughs> <laughs> One Green Bay Packer fan. <laughs> And I'm hoping they will win some more. <clears throat> but in any event, here's what Vince Lombardi said, and it, it occurred to me that it ought to apply to us as a community. Lombardi said, the measure of who we are is what we do with what we have. And what we have, folks, is a school that is costing us 50,000 bucks a year. There's no apparent other, other use for it. Let's do something with it. The other thing we have is we have a group of people with energy and vision. 
let's get going. I urge the selectmen to put this thing in motion and keep moving. Thank you. I personally think this is a very good idea. A study was actually just um, done that 50 year olds and up will approximately have only four friends for the rest of their lives. For 40 or 50 years old and under, they'll only have one friend for the rest of their life, and that could be just their partner, their significant other. So isolation is a very big problem in today's society. I mean, raise your hand if you know someone who's committed suicide. Raise your hand if you know if someone has special needs and they aren't getting what they need. So many. I work at the YMCA, there's special needs kids there, and I can see they're struggling even in that environment because it's still not the right environment for them. Um, and for veterans, we really do need to give back. And Grandy has always been based on community and bonding. And just by this will really help the bondage and I think bring more people together and I think it's very important. I need your information on that. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Joel Danke. I live over on Barndor Hills Road. A uh, real newcomer to Granby, only only ten years. <laughs> One of my first activities in in coming to Granby, uh, maybe some of you were involved in this as well, was uh, going over to Kearns and spreading the bark chip underneath the brand new playground. And so it's a little, you know, it's like kind of you know sad to see Kearns close. Uh, I have a friend who moved to town. Uh, two years ago, we were out riding bike, and we went. I said, "Hey, you hear about this thing about Kearns?" He's like, "What's Kearns?" And I looked him in, and you know, it's a little sad to see that building overgrown. Um, you know, thinking about how my kids really know only Granby as a school um, or as their, their main place. Now, I think that there is a real need for this. Um, I'd like to communicate to the board that you know this is a proposal that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, my wife was a, a Girl Scout troop leader for a number of years, and she always had to struggle to find space. She'd get her room booked, and then she'd get bumped because somebody else had priority for that room. Um, I've hosted Cub Scouts over uh, to my place uh, to work on badges, uh, um, or earn my badge and hurting cats. Um, but having having a, a large shop space like this uh, is something that I think is additive to the community. It's something that brings something new. It's something that I'm personally um, excited about. Um, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm losing my, my, my train of thought, but I, I think, oh, like, you know, the last thing is just as a, as a note, to tie it into the idea of, of you know, this is a, a public good. This is something that makes the community, um, a community, as an identifiable place, identifiable place rather than just a, a place name or a location. Um, my daughter is in middle school. She wa has, you know, she walks down into town, but she walks all the way down to the park. And that sidewalk is a great public good. You know, it, it makes the whole community a little bit more accessible <coughs> to everybody. And, and I think that we should have like strong consideration for this proposal. Um, I'd hate to see that, that currents just kind of like crumble while we consider this or that or the other thing or some proposal that maybe somebody wants to put together when you know we have something that looks very, very exciting in hand. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Any other members of the public? <coughs> Sir, in the back. My name is Frank Shenrock at 34 East Granby Road. Um, these guys have come to me with a plan. Um, 
they have uh, worked it out very well. You can see it tonight. I think at the end of the day, I work with a lot of numbers, and um, over my lifetime, I've come to realize that really what it's all about, it's all about um, when you leave your life and you live it, and you have something to say about something that's been done, and you move ahead with something like this, I think you've accomplished a great objective. And at the end of the day, I think um, moving forward in something like this um, just gives you the ability to reach a point in your life where, at the end of the day, you've done something that gives great value to people in the town. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Before we going once, going twice, I'll look for a motion to close the public hearing and resume Board of Selectmen. Make a motion to close. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, abstention motion carries.